Acts chapter 27 this evening will be our text. And um, much as I tried, there's no way for us to fit the entire chapter into uh, into this uh, into this uh, one sermon. So uh, let's just uh, what we'll do this evening is uh, we'll take uh, for our text verses one through three this evening. It says, and when it was determined that we should sail into Italy, they delivered Paul and certain other prisoners unto one named Julius, a centurion of Augustus's band. And entering into a ship of Adromidium, we launched, meaning to sail by the coasts of Asia, one Aristarchus, a Macedonian of Thessalonica, being with us. And the next day we touched at Sidon, and Julius courteously entreated Paul, and gave him liberty to go unto his friends to refresh himself. So we begin here in chapter 27 with Paul's launch towards Rome. Of course, uh, as, you, as we've been following uh, his, his journey, the things that have been happening of late, we know that this was coming. Uh, even though Paul had been declared innocent uh, by Agrippa and Festus, he had to go to Rome because, well, number one, this had been predetermined by Almighty God, but number two, on the human side of things, uh, he had appealed to Caesar. And as we think about all this, we have to remember that there are always two sides at work here, and they never, they never contradict with each other, right? The fact that, the fact that God in his sovereignty is always at work, but also, somebody's phone's going off. The fact that God's sovereignty is always at work, but also the other fact is that we are responsible for our actions. Now, these two never contradict with each other. God is never surprised at what's going on, but this is a real fact. And so we see that here at work. The Romans weren't saying, well, we have to get you on up to Rome because God is sovereign and he has predetermined that you've got to get there. No, no. They said, we've got to get you to Rome because you've appealed to Caesar. All this was set in motion by God long ago, that this is where he was going to get. Okay. As we dig into this text, I want us to not get too quick into it. I want us to notice chapter 27, as Dr. Luke writes this history, of the early church. He writes what's going on with uh, the Apostle Paul, this early missionary of the church. I 
He says, and when it was determined that we should sail into Italy, they delivered Paul and certain other prisoners unto one named Julius, a centurion of Augustus's band. Luke writes this in the second person using the personal pronoun we. Luke is the author, the scribe of the book of Acts. He's writing this under the inspiration of the Spirit. In fact, it may very well be that he has written this whole book of Acts as a defense of Paul for the Romans, okay? And he's given this account as an eyewitness. He wasn't a prisoner. He didn't have to go to Rome, but it was determined that we should sail into Italy. You see, he differentiates himself as a prisoner. He's not a prisoner. They delivered Paul and certain other prisoners. But he is getting on board and going with Paul. I want you to notice that. Pay careful attention to this and think about this. Luke is the author of the book of Acts. He's an eyewitness of what's going on. And here in this moment, and through all of these troubles that that Paul has already gone through, Luke has chosen to stay by Paul's side. He's Paul's personal physician. He's his missionary companion. He could have gone someplace else. He could have said, you know what? You know what, Paul? See you later. He could have said, Paul, you know what? You you had your way out. You could have chosen to do anything. You didn't have to appeal to Caesar. But you did, and now you're on your way to Rome. You're probably going to get killed for this. I'll catch up with you later if you survive. But he didn't do that. He stuck with him. He was with the missionary through his troubles. I can tell you that it means something to a pastor, to a missionary. When, when you stick with him in their time of need. Luke was that faithful friend and companion to Paul from the time that they came together. If you remember, it was back in chapter 16. Chapter 16 and verse 10 is where we first notice the transition. <coughs> Chapter 16, verses 9 and 10, And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. Luke was with Paul all through from that time forward into his journeys through Europe and Asia and all of those things. And now on into Rome, he goes through the good times and the bad. And by the time Paul gets to the end of his ministry, you know, spoiler alert, okay? But we're all, to some point or another, Bible scholars here, 
But by the time Paul gets to the end of his ministry, look what he wrote in 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 9 through 12. He, wrote, he writes this letter to Timothy, and this is one of his more personal letters. This and 2 Corinthians are very, very personal letters that he wrote. And in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 9 through 12, he says to Timothy, Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me. For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica. Cretans to Galatia, Titus unto Dalmatia. Only Luke. Only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. And Tychicus have I sent to Ephesus. I think of some old soldiers of the cross that I've known. Obviously, obviously, none of us ever knew Paul, but we've known some old preachers. There's some that I've known in my lifetime. My grandfather, who pastored many years at King's Edition, I had the privilege of sitting under his ministry, long ministry at King's Edition that lasted decades. I saw the, 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 the mountaintops, the mountain peaks of his ministry, and I saw the valleys. I saw people come and I saw people go. I saw him go through some tough times, but I saw men who stood with him through thick and thin. I think of Fred Halliman, Peter Halliman's dad. Even Peter Halliman as well. Storm, slander, personal attacks, physical attacks. What an encouragement it is for these men to have others who were there with them. And we see that here in the text. And I think as we get older, we kind of think about those things more. Paul sure thought about it. Only Luke is with me. Do thy diligence to come to me, Timothy. As we read on down in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 14 through 18, he says, Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. Of whom be thou ware also, for he hath greatly withstood our words. At my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, that by me the preaching might be fully known, and that all the Gentiles might hear. I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion, and the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work, and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And then he goes on, Salute Priscilla and Aquila in the household of Onesiphorus. Erastus abode at Corinth, but Trophimus have I left at Miletum sick. Do thy diligence to come before winter. His ministry 
It didn't hinge on whether a certain percentage of men stood with him or not. And in his defense, perhaps in his trial before the Romans, no man stood with him at first. He says so there at my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. He was not bitter about that. In fact, he said, I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. Now, there were some men that he warns Timothy about. And certainly there are men that we have to warn in, about as we go through life. But overall, Paul doesn't have a bitter spirit about him. In fact, overall, it's a very forgiving spirit. He's thankful for those who were standing with him, Luke and Timothy, Priscilla, or Prisca and Aquila, as he, as our Bibles there mention, and others. And even those who would not stand with him. Look what he wrote while he was probably chained up next to a Roman soldier. In Philippians chapter 1, Philippians chapter 1, beginning at verse 12, he said, But I would, ye should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. So that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. And many of the brethren in the Lord waxing confident by my bonds are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife and some also of goodwill, for the one preach Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds, but the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. What then, notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and I therein do rejoice, Yea, and will rejoice. Paul wasn't looking for yes men to follow him, but he was looking for the furtherance of the gospel. And he was thankful for all those who were preaching the gospel. He was thankful for those who would stand with him. And he rejoiced. The gospel was being preached, even if some were preaching Christ in a contentious way, not sincerely. So what's my point in all this? What is, what is my point to come from Acts 27? In verse 1, that little word, we. My point is this. It's better to be a Luke. It's better to be a Paul. If, even if you get into trouble for it with the authorities or whatever happens, it's better to preach the gospel for the right reasons. And if you do end up being a Paul, your name is slandered across the whole known world because you're in trouble for the preaching of the gospel. 
The Roman authorities are after you. Don't be bitter against those who aren't with you. Don't have a bad attitude against those who aren't preaching right, but rather rejoice that the gospel is being preached regardless of the motive. Luke was there. And what an encouragement that must have been for Paul. Go the extra mile when you can. Do what you can for the cause of Christ. Brother David Pittman, he's a friend of mine that goes way back from King's Edition days. He's involved in missions. He, he preached a message in Dayton, Ohio, the other day. I heard it online. He was talking about missionaries. When they go off somewhere, sometimes, and, and, and I know I'm muddling up the illustration because I didn't write it down. I was working, and I, I listened to sermons while I work. But he was talking about how missionaries go off places and they need somebody to stay and hold the rope to help out the missionaries as they go down into places and go 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 places Luke and Timothy and some of those other fellows the church Antioch they were the rope holders for Paul. And that's oftentimes what we can be. Very important. Very important. And he had a really neat brother Pittman had a really neat illustration of a of the missionaries going off of a mountainside. And someone standing at the top holding the rope. Just being a support and help. For those, they go. Back there in our text in Acts 27 and verse 1. Paul and the others, these other prisoners that were there, they were all delivered into the hands of Julius, a centurion of Augustus's band. Now these would have been a group of Roman soldiers that were probably like the cream of the crop who were, who were set to have charge over these, these uh, prisoners to take them from Caesarea all the way to Rome. Verse 2, it says, And entering into a ship of Adramitrum, um, I know I'm mispronouncing that, we launched, meaning to sail by the coasts of Asia. Now, Adramitrum is a seaport in Mysia on the west coast of Asia Minor. The name of this city is actually preserved to this very day in modern-day Turkey. It's a short distance inland from the ancient site, but the name is still there. And so, uh, so that's very interesting. The Bible tells us here in verse 2, one Aristarchus, a Macedonian of Thessalonica, being with us. Now, Aristarchus is also mentioned in other places in the scriptures. Uh, Colossians chapter 4 
in verse 10, Paul, as he wrote, remember he often wrote letters while he was a prisoner. And so he wrote this letter to the Colossians. And look what he wrote here in chapter 4 and verse 10. He says, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, saluteth you. And Marcus, sister's son to Barnabas, touching whom you received commandments, if he come unto you, receive him. Um, Philemon, uh, in verse 24, uh, if we go there, Verse 23, there salute the Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, Marcus, Aristarchus, Demas, Lucas, my fellow laborers. So he's listed there as a fellow prisoner, a fellow laborer. So this was one of Paul's other friends, a missionary companion, was there with Paul on this journey. No doubt this was an uh, encouragement to Paul. No doubt this was an encouragement to those who received these letters. Um, also, not only encouragement, but also as they prayed, there was a lot of concern for these men. Right? To know at least Paul wasn't going through this alone, but also to know that there was more than one in trouble. And so, in verse 3 of Acts The next day we touched at Sidon. Julius courteously entreated Paul, gave him liberty to go unto his friends to refresh himself. So while they were sailing, they stopped at Sidon. Now Sidon is an ancient city. In fact, in fact, the name of Sidon receives its name from Sidon, the firstborn of Canaan, and the grandson of Noah, who founded it. So if you go all the way back to Genesis chapter 10, Genesis chapter 10 and verse 15, Canaan begat Sidon, his firstborn. Um, and so that's how the city gets its name. In verse 19 of Genesis, uh, Genesis chapter 10 and verse 19. And the border of the Canaanites was from Sidon, as thou comest to Gerar, unto Gaza, as thou goest unto Sodom and Gomorrah, Adma. And Zeboam, even unto Lacia. 
So it's a very ancient city going all the way back there. Um, Sidon was also the first home of the Phoenicians. Uh, and thanks to its location, as well as its uh, commercial relations, it became a great city over in Joshua chapter 11. Joshua chapter 11 and verse 8. And the Lord delivered them into the hand of Israel, who smote them and chased them unto the great Zidon. And so we see that, how that we can trace that city all the way back into the Old Testament. Now in the Gospels, Jesus healed a woman of that area. Uh, we've seen some of that even in our studies in the Gospel of Mark. But let's just go very quickly to Matthew chapter 15. Just to refresh a little bit. In Matthew chapter 15. Verses 21, uh, going down to verse 28, it says, And then Jesus went thence and departed into the coasts of Tyre and Sidon. <coughs> oh. And behold, <clears throat> a woman of Canaan came out of the same coasts, <clears throat> cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David, my daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. But he answered her not a word, and his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. But he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then, she, and then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is, it is not meat to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. Then she said, Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus said, answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith, be it unto thee even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. And so Jesus went into the region there, into those districts, and um, healed the daughter of the woman of that area. And people came from as far away as Tyre and Sidon to hear Jesus and to be healed by him over in Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6 and verse 17. And he came down with them and stood in the plain in the company of his disciples, a great multitude of people out of all Judea and Jerusalem, from the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon, which came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And so... Ancient place, the ministry of Jesus had extended on up into there, even in the Gospels. And, and Paul, as he's traveling through a prisoner of the Roman Empire, they stop off in Sidon, and lo and behold, <clears throat> Julius courteously entreated Paul and gave him liberty to go unto his friends to refresh himself. So there were apparently some Christians there who Paul went to go visit. Um, now, 
these are a different sort of people, right? These weren't like uh, these weren't like Luke who traveled with Paul on the journey. These are the types of Christians who, who were there and were willing to open up their home to a traveling preacher, missionary, who is in some trouble, right? So just think of it this way. Paul's in trouble with the government. Yet they were willing, they were willing to open up their homes to be associated with him in order to encourage him. Okay? To ref Julius gives him this liberty. It may be that you can't be like Luke. You can't travel with the missionary. You can't go along with the preacher in his journeys, in his life, whatever it is. You can't be a Luke. You can't be a Timothy, right? As we looked at uh, Paul's letter to Timothy. But maybe you can open up your home to a weary traveler, to a saint, to a Christian who's coming through on life's journey. It was often said that my grandfather's house was the Hobbs Hotel. Oscar Mink used to say that there was always coffee at my grandfather's house. And he was well known for his hospitality. Same thing with John Gilpin. Some of those other guys. We're right here. Close to the I-95 corridor. People travel back and forth. Maybe they're not coming to visit us per se. But is it known that if they need to stop, that they can stop by our house, your house, that they can stop by to, to freshen up a little bit, to take a nap, to have a cup of coffee, right? As they travel down I-95, or, or as we think about not just I-95, but as they travel through life, right? Oh, Things can get weary on our journey through life. And just to be, as he says there, go to your friends and refresh yourself. Hospitality is qualification of the pastor. In Titus chapter 1, Titus chapter 1 and verses 7 through 8. For a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self willed, not soon angry, not given to wine. No striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate. You see that? A lover of hospitality. It's one of the qualifications. But it's not only a qualification for just the pastor, it's also a mark of a believer. In First Peter chapter 4, First Peter chapter 4, in verse 9. Let's, let's start back up here. 
Verse 8, and above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves. Charity meaning love, uh, fervent love among yourselves. For charity or love shall cover the multitude of sins. Use hospitality one to another without grudging. Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12 and Beginning verse 10, he says, Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, distributing to the necessity of saints, given the hospitality. Hebrews chapter 13 Hebrews chapter 13 says it this way. Verses 1 and 2, let brotherly love continue... Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. I just want to put a plug in here. And I had to resist the urge of preaching an entire sermon on hospitality. I did that once. I think I might have been in Mansfield when I did it, but... We often think of entertainment and hospitality. We kind of think of entertainment uh, as, uh, well, I've got to put on a big show for my guests. You know, when you think of like uh, Disney World or whatever, you know, and uh, when, uh, when company comes, uh, we think of uh, well the way that um, the way that uh, most people think of it is well, we got to make sure that the baseboards are clean and the dishes are all put away and all of that sort of thing. Right? But hospitality isn't all about all of that sort of thing. It's not. It's not about putting on a show. For your guests, it's about. Sometimes it's just about being there. It's uh, entertainment. Hospitality isn't all about you, right? Somebody comes. Uh, if I open my house up to a weary traveler, it's not all about me. It's not all about you know how good the house looks and all of that. It's about them. And if they need a a cup of coffee, if they need an ear to to talk to, they need a shoulder to cry on, right? They're not going to remember what the house looked like. They're not going to remember whether the dishes were done, all of those sorts of things. Um, And... um, and all of those things, all that, all that sort of. They're not going to go through the house and check the baseboards and all that. Um, just be there for people. That's what hospitality is about. Giving a cold drink to a weary traveler. Uh, I mean that that'll go a long way for them, and and the Lord will reward you for it. The book of Acts chapter 20, Acts chapter 20, verse 35. 
I have showed you all things, how this so may bring you out to support the weak, and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said it is more blessed to give than to receive. And so just keep that in mind. You know, back in those days, it was, it was essential to be hospitable to travelers. Um, as they went through towns and villages, there were no motels. There were no rest areas. Um, and, um, you know, in our text, Julius didn't have to give Paul the opportunity to go see his friends, but he did. Can you imagine how terrible it would have been? Paul came to the door. You heard the door knocking. And you went and hid because the house was a mess. You went and hid because you weren't expecting company. You thought it might be a salesman. Only to later find out it was Paul. He had been in town. He was on his way to Rome. And soon, he might be executed. What encouragement it is to be open for people, right? To be there for people when they need you. This is a means to help our brothers and sisters but also to think about this, it's a way that we can be a witness to the laws. Whether we can be like Luke or Aristarchus or like the saints in Sidon, may others see Jesus in us. Wherever life takes us. I guarantee you, if we do end up getting into trouble with the Romans or the Americans or the Chinese or whoever, we'll be thankful for those who are willing to travel along with us or those who will be with us along the journey. Well, we'll stop there. And Lord willing, uh, Lord willing, next time we'll continue on in chapter 27. Let's go ahead and have our season of prayer. And uh, I'll ask...